evening. I'm Dick Meserve, the president of the Carnegie Institution, and I would like to welcome you all to a capital science lecture. An ant colony is a marvel of organization. It contains dozens of underground chambers connected by narrow tunnels. There are specialized rooms for nurseries, for food storage, and for mating. The colony is built by the worker ants, which also protect the nest, tend the queen, feed the young, and forage for food. But the queen is not like a human queen. She, indeed no ant, controls the activities of the colony. Yet individual members have particular roles to play in working together. They somehow have solved complex geometric problems, such as the most effective strategy to forage for food. An ant colony is an example of an emergent system. An emergent system contains properties, functions, and behaviors that cannot be predicted by the system's individual components. Were you to observe the behavior of a single ant, it would be nearly impossible to predict the complexity of an ant colony, yet somehow that complexity emerges. There are many examples of emergence around you. Water, for example, is comprised of a simple molecule consisting of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen. Were you to look at a single water molecule, you would hardly be able to predict that millions of them together would make liquid water. Change the external conditions and you get ice or gas. As one physicist has said of emergence, it's not magic, but it feels like magic. Over the last few decades, emergent complexity has become one of the liveliest areas of research in the physical and biological science. It has also been used to study phenomena in other areas, such as psychology, art, traffic engineering, and market economics. We could use more work in the latter category. As our guest tonight will tell us, there are lessons in this approach that help us understand and show the plausibility of biological evolution. With his colleagues at Carnegie's Geophysical Laboratory, Dr. Robert Hazen, our speaker this evening, studies what he calls mineral evolution, the idea that the mineralogical complexity of Earth and other terrestrial planets has evolved through a sequence of stages. The studies of the earliest stages of this process explore how self-organization in minerals might be relevant to the geochemical origin of life. Bob Hazen is a senior staff scientist at Carnegie's Geophysical Laboratory. He received his undergraduate and master's degrees in geology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and then earned his PhD in mineralogy and crystallography at Harvard in 1975. A few years later, after a NATO postdoctoral fellowship at Cambridge, Cambridge University, he joined the Carnegie Institution. In 1999, 1989, he was also appointed the Clarence Robinson Professor of Earth Science at George Mason University, where he serves on a part-time basis. Dr. Hazen's work on mineral evolution stems from decades of study on the relationship between crystal structure and physical properties. During the course of this work, he developed several high-pressure and high-temperature techniques to study the effects of temperature and pressure on atomic arrangements. He also led a team of Carnegie scientists who isolated and identified several new high-temperature superconductors. In 1996, he and his colleagues at Carnegie studied the physical and chemical environments of high-pressure hydrothermal systems. These typically are found uh, deep in the ocean, near ocean trenches and the possible role of these environments on the origin of life. More recently, he has embarked as the leader of a major initiative to study the Earth's carbon cycle with support from the Sloan Foundation. Dr. Hazen has received many awards, including the 1982 Mineralogical Society of America Award, the 1986 American Chemical Society Ipaki F. Prize, the 1989 NASCAP Dean Taylor Award and the 1998 Elizabeth Wood Science Writing Award. In 2008, a new mineral, hazenite, was named in his honor. And last year, he received the Mineralogical Society of America's Distinguished Public Service Medal. This last award, including all the others, uh, was richly deserved. 
at the same time that he undertakes cutting-edge research, Dr. Hazen also manages to promote the public education and public understanding of science as a teacher, author, and public lecturer. He has made numerous radio and television appearances. He has served as an advisor for the National Academy of Sciences, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the NOVA television series, and many other organizations. He has written magazine articles, and he has written some 20 books about science, some with his wife, Margie Hazen, who is here this evening. One of those books, Science Matters, Achieving Science Literacy, has been called one of the finest introductions to science ever written. It has more than 200,000 copies in print in a dozen languages. Dr. Hazen's most recent book is Genesis, The Scientific Quest for Life's Origin. In conjunction with this book, he recorded a 24-lecture video series that is available through the teaching company. No description of Bob Hazen would be complete without mention of music. He has played symphonic trumpet professionally since 1966, performing with numerous ensembles, including the Metropolitan Opera, the Royal Bolshoi and Kirov Ballets, and the National Symphony. Dr. Hazen is currently a member of the National Gallery Orchestra and the National Philharmonic. We are proud tonight to host this remarkable scientist, communicator, and artist as we explore the concept of evolution in complex systems. Please join me in welcoming Carnegie's own Robert Hazen. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> Evolution. No topic creates more tension between science and religion. There are those for whom the Genesis description is sufficient. God created the heavens and the earth. God created plants and animals. God created us in his own image. But scientists want something more. They want to know how God did it. And so we ask ourselves, should we believe in evolution? Now people ask this in a rhetorical way, two different ways. The doubters, the skeptics will say, do you believe in evolution? And the science supporters will say, you do believe in evolution. And so I ask you, do you believe in evolution? Okay, this, this is a little bit of a trick question. Because actually this is a flawed question. And it's flawed in two fundamental ways. First, because the word evolution itself has many different meanings. And until you define the meaning you're talking about, it's hard to answer. But more importantly... Belief. Believe in evolution. Scientists don't believe in evolution. They look for evidence. Reproducible, independently verifiable observations, data, logical reasoning. They weigh the different possibilities. They see what models, what theories, what hypotheses best fit that data, and then that becomes the leading candidate until something better comes along, until it's proven false. So it's not a matter of belief, it's a matter of evidence. So, what I'd like to do tonight is six parts to try to explore evolution, to explore this idea, to see if it's plausible, to see how evolution works. And so the first step is just to define evolution, to tell you what are these different meanings. And then to explore, are there any really viable alternatives to evolution? What are they? I then want to look at this concept that, that Dick so beautifully introduced, emergent complexity. Because the idea here is that there is a way that nature makes simple systems more complex. The fourth is, uh, this is the meat of the talk tonight. I want to look at six different examples of systems that evolve over time. I then want to review what Darwin said about biological evolution. And finally, I want to explain to you why I believe in evolution. Okay, what, what is evolution? What does it mean? The first definition, the first one you come to in a dictionary is just that it's changed over time. 
And any system that changes over time is a system that evolves. But we usually mean something more than that. We usually mean something in which over time there's a complexification, there's an increase in diversity or behavioral complexity or patterning, something like that. And we also usually mean something where there's congruency, that is through time, you go from one stage to the next to the next, and each stage is dependent on the previous one. So there's a continuous nature. And in biological evolution, the way this plays out is through common descent. The idea that every living cell on Earth today had an ancestor, and they had ancestors, you can trace this all the way back to a last common ancestor of cell or populations of cells. That's common descent. And then there's a fifth and this is probably what most people mean when they say, do you believe in evolution? That's Darwinian evolution by a process, by a mechanism called natural selection. But we'll see tonight that that's only one very specialized aspect of a much more general, universal characteristic of nature, evolution. Okay. What are the alternatives? And here, let's imagine we're talking about the origin of life, although we could be talking about the origin of whales, or we could talk about the origin of Earth, or anything. What are the possibilities? Well, one possibility is that it's a miracle. God did it. And none of us here, I can't, you can't prove or disprove this contention. And if life arose as a miracle, then there's no way science can study it because we can't study a miracle which is by definition a violation, something that's outside of natural chemical and physical law. So this is something science has no way of discussing. We can't, we can't say yay or nay. It's also possible that life was fully consistent with chemical and physical principles, but that it's so improbable, it's such a rare event, that in a galaxy, in the universe, excuse me, of, of 100 billion galaxies, each with hundreds of billions of stars, so that there may be a 100 billion, billion Earth-like planets out there, that life... Maybe it only arose once or only a handful of times. And if that's true, then science can no longer study the origin of life and it could have been a miracle. Because in this case, we have a highly improbable event with, with billions of billions of worlds, with hundreds of millions of years to play with, and yet that chemical juxtaposition just rarely happens. So, so that's a possibility too. But as a researcher who studies origin of life, my colleagues and I would all favor philosophically this third possibility, that life is an inevitable consequence of physics and chemistry. On any Earth-like planet, given enough time, life will arise. And we can't prove it. It's just a hunch. But you're not going to spend your life in the laboratory trying to study something that's not inevitable, that's not deterministic. And so this is the, this is the, where I come down. I come down on number three. And there's a fourth possibility. And those who advocate intelligent design would say that we look at life and it's much too complex, and therefore there's an intelligent designer, and the Earth was seeded with life and it came down. Of course, it, it deflects the question of who designed the designers, and that seems to fold back into the first one of these. But this is still out there. And this is a challenge to science, because, you see, what I believe is that life is the consequence of a set of physical principles that there's an emergent complexity. You go from simplicity to complexity through a series of steps, and you can explore that with a set of experiments that you can run. But the intelligent designer says, no, 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 that can't possibly be. You know, it's just like you're walking along in the woods, and, and you look down, and there on the wooded path is, is a wristwatch. And the wristwatch is so intricately manufactured. It has these gears, and it has the hands, and it has all the advanced materials that you know, even though you don't know who it was, you know there was a watchmaker. There was a designer out there. And the watch is so much simpler, so much simpler than even the simplest living cell. And so therefore we know, just intuitive, we know looking at a cell that there had to be a designer. And the problem here is that this has a combination of both some natural or physical processes, but also an unknown, what you might call supernatural designer. And so how do you deal with that as a scientist? You can't disprove this. You cannot disprove this idea. So what I do, say let's go to the laboratory. Let's design an experimental program that allows us, step by step, in a laboratory environment, to go from simplicity to complexity. Let's show the origin of life, step by step, by emergent step. And if we can do that, if we can show that there's a natural process by which you go from simplicity to complexity, intelligent design is unnecessary. I'll give you an analogy. Stonehenge, the great stone monument on the southern plain of England, the Salisbury Plain, built 4,500 years ago, and some people claim was built with the help of space aliens. 
flying saucers came and they picked up those giant stones and they lifted up and they flew them in and they set them into place. And I can't prove that. I can't disprove it. Nobody can prove or disprove that. It's just a contention. It's out there. But what we can say is that a primitive society, 500 to 1,000 able-bodied people using ropes, using wood, using stone tools, using ingenuity, they could have done it too. And if you can show that, then the need for space aliens is obviated. And indeed, I think that most people then would conclude it was done by humans. Lots of time, lots of hard work, ingenuity, but they could do it. So why resort to some other case? So what is the process then in nature by which simple systems become complex? And that process is emergent complexity. Okay, emergent complexity is the way that you can go from simple systems to pattern systems, and you do it because of the interaction of individual agents, particles, units. Each unit, each particle, each agent interacting only with its own local environment. So, for example, think about a sand grain. It's in contact with other sand grains. Gravity is pulling down on it. Wind or water is pushing to the side. Each sand grain only responding to its local chemical environment, what you get is pattern, you get ripples, you get dunes, you get braids, all the intricate patterns. On a much larger scale, each star in a galaxy is responding only to its local gravitational forces. And yet you get these beautiful spiral patterns, the patterns of a familiar spiral galaxy. In a biological context, in a much more complex system to be sure, your conscious brain billions of interacting neurons, each neuron complexly connected to others, but no one neuron is conscious, and yet the collective property of consciousness is a classic example of emergent complexity. There's so many examples. One of my favorites is the slime mold, the social amoeba called Dictyostelium. It lives most of its life like this. It's a single-celled amoeba-like organism in the, in the forest, but under certain chemical signals that come along, it starts congregating. They start moving together. They sense each other. And then they form a slug-like entity that crawls across the forest floor. It finds a happy place, and it makes these beautiful, soft-like structures. Spores are emitted from the top. A new generation of Dictyostelium is born, and they melt back to becoming single-celled creatures. An astonishing example. And it doesn't have to be entirely... Um, physical objects. Craig Reynolds, about 30 years ago, designed a program to describe flocking birds. That's a collective behavior. What he did is he called, talked about boys. Each of these little triangles is a boyd. And he wanted to mimic in this program the way birds flock, the way fish school, the way insects swarm. And so he said, let's add together three vectors shown in red here. One, you don't want to hit your flock mate, so you have to have separation. The second is you want to sort of go in the same direction as your flock mate, so you have alignment. The third, called cohesion, you want to steer more or less towards the flock mates. And so you can weight these three vectors in different ways. And what you come up with then is a remarkable example of a program that mimics the natural world. So here's a very early version of Boyd's. Unless you think this is an idle exercise, Craig Reynolds is now quite wealthy because if you've watched the Batman movies with, with swarming bats or the Finding Nemo with schooling fish and so forth, all those computer-generated programs are done this way. And just because it's fun and because it sort of reminds us of the fact that this is not just an idle exercise, I want to show you a video that was taken over Rome of starlings. And what we see here are flocking starlings, astonishing, sinuous forms. It almost looks like a single organism. That's because the cohesion vector is so heavily weighted in starlings that you get these remarkable forms. Um, if you've ever seen this, it is absolutely mesmerizing. So, that's a kind of organized behavior that you will find. Now, as I say, these don't always have to be tangible particles like sand grains or starlings or stars. You can play an individual note. And that's not very interesting, and it certainly isn't music, but if you take lots of notes and put them together and use 
the selection rule called harmony and counterpoint, you can get music. And so forth. Music is an emergent phenomenon. There are many examples. In life, we see it at the scale of molecules and the way cells are organized. We see it at the scale of cells, dictyostelium. We see it at the scale of social animals like insects. Here, this is an amazing photograph. These are individual ants that are tending aphids. Now, each ant is just responding to local environment and somehow the ant colony does its amazing thing. We see it with human society as well in agriculture. We see it in sporting events like a marathon. And my favorite, of course, the symphony orchestra. No one person can play a symphony, but with all those people and all those different instruments combined, you get a really amazing emergent phenomenon. Okay. So, what are some of the complex evolving systems we see in nature today? And what do they tell us about how systems evolve, how they change through time? Well, let's look at six of them. Elements and isotopes, mineral evolution, then chemical evolution, the evolution of the organic molecules that led to the origin of life. We're going to look at languages. We're going to look at material culture. We're going to look at popular culture. And my rhetorical argument here is that we see evolving systems all around us all the time. They're everywhere. Why should biology be any different? Why should this be such a strange concept? Anyway, so let's look about this. Now, there are six themes that you see running throughout this, and there are actually more, but six themes in all evolving systems. Species, or the idea of kinds, types. You have to have those. You also have selection. You have selection because there are many different configurations that are possible, and only the ones that work will be selected for. This is the deterministic aspect of all evolving systems. You also have diversification. You have niches. You have punctuation events. Evolution in all of these systems is not a continuous change over time, but there are jumps, there are spikes, and of course you have extinction. So, let's look at some. Let's talk about elements and isotopes first. We go back to the Big Bang. We're told that 13.7 billion years ago, and of course the universe was unimaginably hot and dense at the time, but it expanded, it cooled, it expanded, it cooled. We're told that roughly a few hundred thousand years, you began to see the first elements emerge from that incredible maelstrom. And there were three elements. There was hydrogen, there was helium, a little bit of lithium, and in fact five different isotopes. Isotopes are just different arrangements of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. And so you see this very simple arrangement that these early isotopes were able to then combine gravitationally into larger and larger clumps, huge masses of hydrogen forming the first stars. And those stars then underwent fusion reactions. Hydrogen making helium, helium making carbon, carbon, you know, oxygen, neon, you know, magnesium, silicon, all the way up to iron. And so the earliest stars then produced more elements, more isotopes. And when you reached iron, though, you ran out of the options of doing fusion. The stars suddenly collapsed, they exploded in supernovas, and you now seeded the universe with all of these elements. So the next generation of stars had iron. And because the next generation of stars had iron, it could go through what's called the R process. It's a rapid neutron capture process, which led to many more elements. And so the second and third and fourth generation stars did this. And ultimately, you keep enriching this. You keep evolving the system. And here's what the sun's distribution looks like. Uh, so you see, you eventually get up to as many as 2,000 different isotopes in a situation like this, many of which are now extinct because they radioactively decay very quickly. And so we see an evolutionary process from simplicity to complexity. We see punctuation events and the explosion of a supernova, all the characteristics of an evolving system. And of course, all of these elements are the things that went into making planets like Earth. And hence, we go to mineral evolution. Mineral evolution is the idea that mineral species also have changed dramatically through time. Now, a mineral species is nothing more than a specific composition with a specific crystal structure. And these days we know about 4,400 different species. What we're going to look at is the change over time in diversity, but also things like the distribution near the surface, the compositional rays of minerals we can talk about, just their sizes and shapes. For, for simplicity design, I'm just going to look at this diversity question. What is the first mineral in the cosmos? 
Well, it turns out you go back to the exploding star because here's where you make carbon, here's where you make oxygen, silicon, aluminum, the basic building blocks of minerals. And as the star expands and, and cools in the envelope, very high temperature minerals can form first. And we now know that diamond is probably the first mineral in the cosmos, and, and these other ones follow, about a dozen in all. We study these in what are called pre-solar grains. Larry Nittler at the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism here at Carnegie makes his specialty looking at these. These are the oldest objects that we know. They can be billions of years older than our solar system. These, they come from previous generations of stars. Anyway, so the question in mineral evolution is how do you get from 12 to more than 44? And what we argue is that there are three modes, three mechanisms of mineral evolution. The first one is just the selection and concentration of chemical elements. That is, you have rare elements like uranium and beryllium and cesium, and you basically, through various processes, can concentrate and select those and, and then get new minerals as a process. Another one is just the increased range of temperatures and pressures that result when you form planets. And finally, the, the most important, the influence of life, a really startling um, realization from the mineralogical community. And what we describe are three eras of mineral evolution. The first is the era when planets are forming. This is basically with the meteorites that we find today. The second has to do with the way planets rework their outer layers, the crust, the upper mantle. And then finally, the influence of life. So, let's look at these in more detail. Imagine the solar nebula, all those dust, gas, hydrogen, helium, coming together, and those dust grains, remember, these contain the 12 Ur minerals. And most of the mass is concentrating where the sun is going to be. Hydrogen, helium, dust grains, they concentrate more and more. Gravity pulls them in. This object is getting larger and larger. The temperatures and pressures are getting greater and greater in the center until suddenly fusion reactions begin. And when that happens, the sun goes through a violent period when there's bursts of intense radiation that bathes that disk-like nebula where the planets are going to form. So intense that it melts the grains. It forms little droplets that you see up here in what are called chondrite meteorites. And as you go from 12 minerals up to about 60, 60 primary minerals in the chondrites. But then the chondrites themselves start clumping together. They form planetesimals the size of this auditorium, then the size of Washington, D.C., then 100, 200, 300 kilometers across. And when you get to that size, you begin to melt the interior, you separate out an iron-rich core, you have a silicate-rich mantle, you get lots more mineral diversification, these objects collide with each other, you get fluid interactions, you get heating, you get shock minerals. And this leads you up to about 250 minerals, the minerals that are known from all the meteorites that are still falling on Earth today. So throughout Earth history, and in fact throughout the history of all the inner planets in our solar system, these 250 minerals are kind of the the baseline, that's the starting point of planets. So now we get to the era of crust and mantle reworking. Planets are able to rework their surfaces through a variety of processes. If you don't have a lot of water, then you can't make a lot of more minerals. And we think that the Moon and Mercury probably got to about 300 mineral species and then stopped, at least if, unless there's a lot more water than we suspect. If you have water, it gives you the option of making things like clay minerals, evaporite minerals, ices, and that can get you up to maybe 500 mineral species. So we think that's probably the end point of Mars. Venus is a little trickier because it's a large planet, but it's also very hot on the surface, so that may be a special case. There may be a different kind of mineral evolution there. But Earth is something different. The Earth has a lot of water and has a lot of time. And so the reworking of the crust by water rock interactions, concentrated rare elements. We see elements of boron, lithium, beryllium, tantalum, cesium, these rare minerals, about 500 that occur in a rare kind of rock called pegmatite. And so this quickly gets you up to about a thousand minerals on Earth, but it may have taken a billion years to do this. And Earth had another trick up her sleeve. She was able to do plate tectonics, and you see this reworking as the crust is constantly in turmoil, as parts of crust sink down into the metal, they partially melt. Vast volumes of Earth's surface, therefore, become molten, and this causes new eras of reworking of rocks. High-pressure minerals are brought to the surface, and as a result, you get up to about 1,500 minerals, and we say, that's it. We can't come up with any mechanisms for going beyond 1,500. 
But Earth today has 4,400 known minerals. Where did they come from? They must have come from life. And so now we come to the era of biomediated mineralogy. And here's basically the culprit. It's algae. Photosynthetic organisms. They produce oxygen. And as a result of oxygen, you had massive deposits of iron oxide. For the first time, you had massive deposits of manganese oxide. All these different oxidized, weathered phases. And we suspect that two-thirds of all the new mineral species on Earth are biologically mediated. They're the consequence, the indirect consequence, of life changing the atmosphere and the oceans of our planet. That's where we come from. So many minerals, so many of the beautiful minerals in our museums, turquoise, azurite, malachite, thousands of others. And then 500 million years ago, life learned how to make its own minerals, calcium carbonate shells, silica shells, other minerals, transforming the surface of Earth in dramatic ways, the coevolution of the geo and biosphere. Okay, so we've seen elements and isotopes. We've seen minerals evolve. Let's now talk about the origin of life, chemical evolution. We talk about the origin of life in sort of two stages. The first is taking the raw materials of the early Earth and making the first cell, and then after that I'll talk about biological evolution, natural selection in a little bit. So here's the idea. We have three assumptions. The first one is that the origin of life is based on carbon molecules, organic molecules, the same chemistry we see in life today. There's nothing exotic here. The raw materials, simply the ocean's atmosphere, rocks and minerals. And that there's a step, the sequence of steps of emerging complexity going from the simplicity of the geochemical world to the complexity of the biochemical world. That's what we're talking about here. So, we think of, I think of this in terms of four emergent steps. The first is just making the basic building blocks, the molecules. Second is organizing them or selecting them, concentrating them to make polymers, to make membranes, the kind of structures we know that life needs. Then you have a self-replicating system, and once you have a self-replicating system, natural selection, biological evolution follows automatically. Well, what are we trying to do here? We basically want to take simple, the agents in this game are volcanic gases. Water, CO2, carbon monoxide, hydrogen disulfide, maybe nitrogen or ammonia, hydrogen. Take those, you mix them together. What you want is to get chemical reactions that form carbon-carbon bonds. So this is two carbons here, acetic acid. Here's three carbons in pyruvic acid. Remember this molecule, because I'll come back to this, the three-carbon molecule pyruvic acid. But what you're trying to do is make carbon-carbon bonds. That's the key to organic synthesis here. And we know this is fairly simple. It's straightforward. For over 50 years, we've known about the Miller-Urey experiment conducted at the University of Chicago in the early 1950s. Beautiful, elegant, simple experiment where you had gases to represent a primitive atmosphere. You had water to represent a primitive ocean. You had electric sparks, lightning in that atmosphere. And after just a couple of days, you got an abundance of molecules. The amino acids that make proteins, sugars that make carbohydrates. We have carboxylic acids, which are fundamental to metabolism, and also they make the membrane structures. And even the building blocks of DNA and RNA, they're all here. And to all the world, this looks like a balanced diet. In fact, people thought this had to be the way it was done, except recent research has shown it can be done many, many other ways as well. For example, in deep space, the radio astronomers tell us that the molecular clouds and the vastness of space are filled with these molecules. Where there's ultraviolet radiation, you find organic molecules. And you can simulate this in the laboratory. You can make a vacuum chamber. You can chill it down to 10 degrees above absolute zero. You can shine ultraviolet radiation on those small molecules, and you make organics. You make amino acids, you make sugars, you make the building blocks of life. And in our experiments, we concentrate on these deep hydrothermal zones, the volcanic black smokers on the ocean floor, mineral-rich zones where there's lots of chemical energy to be had. What we do is we make simple gold tube experiments. We seal chemicals in the tube. This is one of our earliest experiments. Here's pyruvic acid. Remember, that's three carbons. Added CO2, what we're hoping to see is 3 plus 1 goes to the 4-carbon molecule, oxaloacetic acid. Very simple reaction. It would have been significant biologically. Very modest conditions, 200 degrees Celsius, 2,000 atmospheres, the kinds of things you find beneath the ocean floor in many environments around the Earth. And so we ran these things. The gold tubes puffed up. We opened them up. Pop. 
their foam, they fizz, this yellow-brown oily goo pours out of the capsule. This is not oxaloacetic acid. This is something very different. It smells different. It smells at lower temperature like molasses. At higher temperatures, just like Jack Daniels. It's, it's, it's just amazing. You're making interesting molecules here, and when you do the analysis, it's, it's sort of horrifying. Every one of these peaks is one or more molecules. There are thousands of different organic species here. In fact, the problem in origin of life is not making the molecules. You make too many of them. So the real problem then is the second emergent step. That's the selecting and concentrating, organizing those molecules in the useful system. How in the world can that happen in such a mess? So we took a droplet of this yellow-brown oily goo. We put it in water, and lo and behold, what happens? It does the job for us. This is what nature does. These are individual vesicles. They're fluorescent. They've got an inside. They've got an outside. It's a beautiful example. And we see this phenomenon over and over and over again in the natural world. Forming this kind of self-organized system is a part of the origin of life. It's deterministic. It will happen on any planet or moon anywhere in the cosmos. And if this doesn't get you where you want to go, then you've got minerals. And here is the coevolution of minerals and life. Because minerals have this amazing property. They have surfaces that select and concentrate molecules. And not only that, they solve one of the most intractable problems in the origin of life. That's the handedness of life. Because molecules, amino acids, come in left and right-handed forms. Sugars come in left and right-handed forms. But life uses the left-handed amino acids. It gets rid of the right. It uses right-handed sugars. It gets rid of the left. How did that happen? Well, one possibility, as our experiments show, is you can concentrate left and right-handed molecules on left and right-handed mineral surfaces. And there will be trillions upon trillions of these surfaces on the early Earth, and over hundreds of millions of years, you have a lot of opportunities to run little chemical experiments on handed surfaces, left-handed surfaces, right-handed surfaces. And someplace along the way, one of those systems learned to make copies of itself. It might have been left-handed, it might have been right-handed. I think it's probably a chance. And so, life emerges. Languages. So we looked at elements and isotopes, we looked at mineral evolution, we looked at chemical evolution. Now let's look at a system that everybody, for, for years, has talked about evolution. The linguists talk about language evolution. They make trees. And without belaboring it, we have extinction, words go extinct, whole languages go extinct. Also, maybe less obviously, we have punctuation. There was an article in Nature a couple of years ago describing Noah's new American dictionary. And it turns out Noah Webster's New American Dictionary was a punctuation event in the English language. If you look at newspapers the year before and the year after in America, you saw the divergence of British English and American English at that time. Okay. What about material culture? Well, there's lots of examples. I, I happen to particularly be interested in the evolution of trumpets. And, and 300 years ago, this was a state of the art. It's a long grass tube, and it's rather limited. So that's a little bit of Handel's trumpet tail sound from Messiah. And if you want to play Baroque music in the key of D major, this is a great instrument. This is the instrument for you. But if you want to play in C major or B flat major or F major, you've got to get a totally different trumpet. And if you want to play in a minor key, forget it. It doesn't do it. So, trumpeters got frustrated, and what they did was they invented a new instrument. By the way, this is lateral transfer. These keys came, of course, from bassoons and oboes and clarinets, the woodwind family, said, let's stick them on a brass instrument. So they made key trumpets and key bugles. And in fact, you did get a chromatic instrument. by my side. <laughs> but um, this solved a lot of problems. Haydn wrote his trumpet concerto from one of these. Hummel wrote his trumpet concerto from one of these. But it's a rather uneven tone. The keys were awkward and ungainly. 
and a new technology came along, and that's the technology of the steam engine. The steam engine that gave you airtight valves, and it was transferred to metallurgy, the technology to brass instruments. And so now you had an instrument that could play the whole chromatic range. What a difference. I mean, it's just, it's just like, it makes our lives a lot easier. And, like, and, and of course, and of course, this is just the tip of the iceberg in evolution. You had, you had diversification, you had niches, you had jazz trumpets, you had classical trumpets, you had brass band trumpets, you have student trumpets, you have professional trumpets, you have cornets, you have flugelhorns. It just radiates and radiates and radiates. That's what evolution does. And because it's selection, you see there's lots of different ways you can put together keys and valves and brass tubing, but it's controlled by human physiology. You have to have a mouthpiece at one end. You have to have a bell. You have to have a continuous link of tubing. It has to be physiologically approachable. There's so many selection mechanisms. That's how evolution works. And then there's Broadway. You know I was going to get to Broadway. I gave you a tip off on that. And here we see evolution in popular culture. All right. This is Broadway from around 1915. Okay. Well, the music's kind of trivial. There's no plot. The dancers are not highly skilled, at least in the context of our modern way of thinking. But in 1915, if you visited New York City, you might really enjoy going to that show. It's quite spectacular. But things evolve. And so come, along come Rodgers and Hammerstein and give a whole new kind of musical theater. 1945, this is Carousel. <laughs> I find that amazing. It's a 19th century dance form. It's ballet. It's classical ballet. But it was an amazing advance in terms of musical theater. And also, this was probably the first really popular musical that had a tragic ending to it. Three years later, though, Cole Porter's most famous musical, Kiss Me Kate, came along. And that was much more in the mainstream. This introduced jazz dancing, and this is the kind of thing that really became the standard thing. And that's pretty, I mean, you, you'll see that on Broadway today in some, some cases, but there was a punctuation event, 1957. There was a synthesis of classical and jazz, which had never been seen before. There was a level of intensity and dancing had never been seen before. That was one kind of story. And, of course, that's not the end of the evolution of the musical theater. Think about Cats. Think about Sweeney Todd. And one of the wonderful things about the arts is that they're constantly moving forward. They're constantly trying new things, building on the past. There's, there's congruency, but it's always evolving, always changing, and we share in that. We revel in that. I mean, the arts are amazing that way. So is science. Okay. So we've seen elements and isotopes. We've seen mineral evolution. We've seen organic chemicals. You've seen languages, you've seen popular culture and material culture. Evolution in every case. Why should biology be different? Here's what Charles Darwin said. He said, at some point a first cell arose. That first cell had no competition. And so it rapidly multiplied, it radiated into all sorts of niches, and there were variations in the population. You started selecting for functions, selecting for populations that thrived in different environments, and so you had evolution through this process. 
So the amazing thing to me is that Darwin based this idea on what we might consider very minimal evidence. Think about the famous finches of Galapagos. And sure, you see, maybe there was one original finch and it radiated out into the finches in different islands that were widely separated, seed eaters, and, and there were cactus eaters and bud eaters and insect eaters, and they had their own specialized beaks. But if you really look at it, I mean, these are all pretty similar types of birds, and, and many people would say, well, this is just microevolution, microevolution. But how do you get the really major changes in evolutionary change? And Darwin himself admitted it. He was, he was confused by this. Look at this. This is his quote about an eye. He says, I freely confess, he's saying that the evolution of an eye from a non-sighted organism is absurd in the highest possible degree. Well, he was being far too modest about his theory because we know now that this, in fact, is not just a probable event. It's a deterministic event in the origin of life. Here's how it happens. And this is a, thanks to a computer model that was developed in 1994 by Nelson and Pelger, a really remarkable piece of work in which they said, let's imagine an organism, think of it as a worm, for example, has a set of three layers of cells on its back. The top layer, shown here in white, is transparent to light, although it can have an index of refraction. It can bend the light one way or another. The second layer is light-sensitive cells in gray here, and that's certainly not a stretch because even individual microbes can be sensitive to light and move to shadows when light shine on them. So we know they're light-sensitive cells. And the black bottom is just the support structure. And they have an aperture that's the distance from here to here. And what he said was let's very randomly, plus or minus 1%, the curvature, instead of being flat, it can be bowed out or bowed in. Let's vary the aperture, that's the distance between those two ends. And let's vary the index of refraction, plus or minus 1%. And if you increase visual acuity, if you're better able to see your surroundings, even by that little bit, we'll keep that change. Because if you can tell where a shadow is coming from, if you can tell how far away it is, maybe that'll help you escape the predator. And so they did this randomly. And here's the first 176 steps, going from a flat surface to a slightly curved surface, a sort of a pit that allows you to see what's going on. And as you continue this evolutionary process, Remember, these are computer-generated random changes. You select it that makes things better. After about 800 steps, this is after 1,000 steps, you have a perfectly spherical eye pit. In fact, there are many organisms that actually have this kind of eye, an eye pit like this. But it didn't stop there. Because you can vary index of refraction, you start forming a lens. And then things get really interesting. And finally, after about 1,800 random steps, you have an absolutely perfectly designed eye. You could not make an eye that was better optically than this one. And if you run this program over and over and over again, you get the same result every time. That's why I say, if God did it, she was smart enough to use evolution. Okay. So why do I believe in evolution? Number one, we see evolving systems all around us, everywhere, all the time. We see it in elements and isotopes. We see it in minerals. We see it in the molecules that make life. We see it in languages. We see it in material culture. We see it in popular culture. So, why would you think biology would be different? What possible reason would you have for putting it in a different category? Okay, that's number one. Number two, the theory of evolution makes remarkable predictions. Here's a quote from 1985. The creationists realized, and rightly so, that whale evolution was not fully explained. They said, how is it possible that a land animal from 50 million years ago suddenly turns into a whale? You know, it would have had to lose its legs and there's no rhyme or reason to it, no rationale. And the paleontologist said, yes, indeed, that's true. We sort of missed, we forgot about this. We need to go out and we look for whales. And not only do we look for whales that have atrophied hind legs, but we know exactly when to look for them. We know exactly where to look for them. You go to places where there's a shallow oceanic sediment, like Maui today, off the coast of Maui, where whales come, and some of them die, and some of them sink to the bottom, and they get buried, and they get turned into fossils. You go to those places, and if you go 50 million years old, you better find things that look like four-legged creatures. If you go 40 million years old or 30 million years old, you're going to see the whale legs getting smaller. If you don't, then Darwin's in trouble. What do they do? They go out 50 million years ago. They find ambulocetus the walking whale. Funky-looking beast, 
clearly partly adopted the land, partly the water, but that's nothing new. We have seals. We have sea lions. They're pretty awkward on land and, and so forth. Go to 46 million years old. There's Rhodocetus. What a beautiful creature this is. Stumpy back legs. The front legs are sort of like flippers, but looking pretty whale-like to me. 35 million years ago, there's the Bacillosaurus. You can see uh, one of these skeletons at the Smithsonian in the Hall of Ocean Life. Magnificent toothed whale. And here, the hind legs are only about a foot and a half long. Really, really vestigial. It's a 35 foot long creature. So, so those are pretty tiny. And so you see this sequence, just like Darwin predicted, just like the paleontologists expected and predicted and went out and looked at And this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are over a hundred fossil whales in the last 50 million years. All different sizes and shapes. And you can see the divergence, for example, from the toothed whales to the baleen whales. You can see that in the fossil record. It has to be there or Darwin and natural selection is wrong. But the predictions are made and they're always found to be true. Finally, why do I believe in evolution? I believe in evolution because I cannot accept the alternative idea of God in the gaps. For whales, the argument would go like this. 50 million years ago, there was a land animal. Today, there's a whale. Oh, it's just impossible to think of a way that you could transfer. So God must have done it. But then you find a whale that's a little more recent. You find this one. You find this one. You find this one. You find this one. And God is beginning to look awfully small to me. I love trilobites. I collect trilobites. I collected my first one about 50 years ago. And the collection has grown since then. And I am awed by the diversity of forms of trilobites. 10,000 or more different species. Now, I suppose it's possible that God made every one of these separately. Independent creation. But if you look at all the trilobites, they also form a beautiful branching tree of forms of ecosystems radiating out into new zones. How much more elegant it is to have a natural process, a lawful process. It doesn't violate natural laws. It matches violence. It's deterministic. That you go from step to step to step. That's how evolution works. So I want you to think about evolution in a different way tonight. Look, I know for some people this is troubling. It's hard to imagine how we could be created in God's image if we're the process of random mutation, even if selection is deterministic. How can life have meaning? How can it have purpose? What is our role if we're just that random process? Think of another way. We're not random. You start with the Big Bang. Inevitably, inexorably, you create hydrogen. From that hydrogen, you create stars. And all the isotopes and all the elements, and those stars explode, and they feed the universe with a complete periodic table of the elements, the elements that form planets like Earth. And from Earth, inevitably, inexorably, you get organic chemical evolution. Step by step, from simplicity to complexity. Life being a cosmic imperative, it emerges. And then life evolves by the process of natural selection. Step by step, to intelligence, to us. And so we are living in a cosmos that is learning to know itself. Thank you. Bob has clearly provided us with a very wide-ranging and really quite, quite remarkable lecture. Um, we do have time for a few questions. Uh, there are microphones in the aisle, and I would welcome anyone who would like to ask a question to come to the microphone, and we'll have a few minutes to allow some questioning from the audience. Please. Uh, thank you so much. You defined evolution. Unless I missed it, you didn't define life, and uh, I'm wondering if your definition presupposes uh, carbon, and so my question is, 
can there be life based on something other than carbon? I'm thinking specifically, possibly, silicon. Certainly people have thought a lot about other chemical systems that could lead to life. I think it's hard to imagine silicon chemistry doing it because silicon compounds tend to be very fixed and very rigid. Carbon molecules tend to be much more able to adapt and vary and do the kinds of mutation that we think of in the larger life form. But in terms of the definition of life, I'm very fuzzy on that because I don't think that there's a very obvious transition point between the non-living world and the living world. If you think about an evolving system, you're thinking about a system that increasingly complexifies step by step becoming more complex. And where you draw the line, this is life, this isn't, becomes rather arbitrary. And furthermore, I think there may be chemical systems at higher temperature, higher pressure zones, perhaps even within our own Earth, which do chemically really interesting things. They may not be cellular life the way we think of it, but they may have some chemical properties that are more like reproduction or spreading laterally as a film across surfaces. And so, rather, I mean, nature is what nature is. It does what it does. And we see the richness of nature all the time. So I think that our, our knowledge of what life is, is is right now too focused on our own our own planet. Uh, I appreciate the details of what you've been through, but it is a review of what probably most of the people already, if not the details, recognize. In other words, you're preaching to the choir to a certain extent. But my my point, two points. One, I think at one point, science is going to have to deal with what you're talking about and entropy and figure out how they work together and so forth. That's one thing. But the thing I'm mostly concerned about is emergence offers a, for lack of a better word, spooky kind of it gets better and better and better and more complex. However, one thing that doesn't come out is the the disruption and the the lack of of a linear um, process. You have branches of evolution, you have collapses, uh, you have major changes in environmental things, and I'm not just talking about our environment, but environment in a, a very basic sense. So what I'm getting to is that we have to start dialoguing about what major disruptions occur because social evolution is the currently probably one of the principal ones that we're concerned about. And if we don't blend this kind of thing and understand the disruptive periods, we could we could kid ourselves into thinking there's something better coming along without understanding that disruption that could occur. Okay. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say that preaching to the choir, sometimes they're the only ones who listen. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but in terms, you know, part of what you're saying is a challenge. Where do we go from here? I presented a framework. Just to get people to think that evolution is not just restricted to biology all around us all the time. The next step, and what we've been doing, is trying to study in detail how each of these evolving systems works, and particularly the idea, you were talking about entropy, the idea of information transfer. How in each of these systems do you transfer information from a larger environment to a local object? Transferring it, for example, by lateral transfers, or transferring it of, in, in other ways in biological systems. And if we can understand, therefore, the, the system as a whole becomes, has increasing entropy. But the local volume, the object, the cell, whatever you want to call it, it has increasing order, and that's because information is being transferred. And there are all sorts of mechanisms. In the geochemical environment, there are mechanisms. In the material culture environment, there are mechanisms. And that's what we need to study. If we can understand the mechanisms of evolution, the themes and variations in these many different systems, then I think we can address more intelligently all the questions you're talking about. Please. I was just curious, so you talked about evolution in systems, where they began, how they moved forward. So I was curious, because viruses are a very particular topic in biology, because we're not quite sure if they're living or not. But how would they have come about as far as evolution? What niche would they have filled? And what would be the purpose of them in the bio biological system? And seriously, how would they evolve? And such? So what you're asking is, is a wonderful question about function. 
because the reason things evolve is you have a system that has many different configurations and only some of those configurations have a function. And you select for the function. So what is the function of a virus? Well, it doesn't have to be something that helps other cells or organisms. It may be that a virus is a stripped-down cell that's learned how to survive with, without putting a lot of effort into metabolism, and it uses other organisms. Maybe this, the, the, the virus arose as a separate entity and then became parasitic on something else. I don't know, and there are other people who are real experts on this. But the key thing is to think about what is the function, and the reason viruses survive and they're so successful is because they've, they've, their function is that they make copies of themselves so efficiently in the environment in which they find themselves. If we're lucky, you and I might uh, live another 40 or 50 years. What do you think the chances are that in our lifetime we're going to see another life form discovered in our own solar system? One in ten, of course, one in a hundred. Well, one I'm, in a I'm not going to put a number on it. I think that our best chance of doing that, uh, another life form in our own solar system, I would put my money right now, number one, on drilling deep. That's what a deep carbon observatory wants to do. I think if we go down four, five, six miles and we pull up rocks at temperatures above where cellular life can live, I think we might find another whole domain of life. But in terms of extra Earth, then Mars, I, you know, and I think it's, you know, either it is or it isn't. It's 50-50, right? <laughs> That's my answer. <laughs> well, Bob has really provided us with a remarkable evening. Please join me in thanking him.